Hello, and welcome to the Growth Mindset Podcast, hosted by me, Sam Harris. A person with a growth mindset believes that their most basic abilities can be developed through dedication and hard work. Brains and talent are just the starting point. This view creates a love of learning and a resilience that is essential for great accomplishment. On the podcast, I find incredible individuals doing things I'd like to be great at. I break down their approach and insights to show how people can go about achieving their dreams. Over the first season, I interview some of the most fascinating individuals from my network as I explore the direction to take the podcast with the only main goal of recording interesting and informative audio. When I began recording the podcast, I was interning as a developer and go on to launch my own development agency work as a nomad from a remote island in Greece, where I spent my spare time climbing. I learned how to speak properly and immediately tried to implement this ability on girls, disastrously. I then co-launched an AI business that gets funded by an accelerator in Hong Kong. This first season ends in Kazakhstan on my journey to my new home in Hong Kong. It's been an incredible six months and my absolute pleasure to talk to some amazing individuals and to share these conversations with you. For this first introduction, Precast, I have no other than my mother with me. On a brief visit home, I took the chance to discuss what makes me do the things I do, as no one knows you better than your mother. I thought it would make a useful introduction for the listener, and I honestly did not expect to learn as much as I did during this episode. I'm really chuffed that I did it. So without further ado, here is me with my mother. Hi, Mum. Hi, Sam. I'm good, thanks. How are you? Uh, I'm great, thank you very much. So, as you know, I am starting a podcast, and uh, I've been going through my first few episodes, and I've got everything ready to launch, but I realised that I now need to um, have a bit more of an introduction to the podcast, and like why I'm doing it, and the point of the podcast is kind of to help people sort of grow and kind of do things that they might not normally do, or like Mm -hmm. learn and take on new challenges, how do I go about these things, and what do I normally come to you for, and these kind of stuff. Right. Okay. Good English there, Sam. All right, that's cool. So now I do remember when you were a lifeguard at the swimming pool. Okay. And um, you were studying for your A levels, so you weren't very young. You were six one. Age, yeah. And you wanted to go on your gap year, mm-hmm. and I said no. I remember that. Because yeah. I <laughs> thought you should just go and a different story. Go to university, um, and I <laughs> said so quite clearly from the start, without any sort of. Um, you know, there was no axe to grind. It was just a, well, I'm not paying for you to go on a gap year because I don't, couldn't see the value of it. And you said, okay, I'll pay for it. And you just put in extra hours at the swimming pool, Mm -hmm. um, early mornings, late nights, all day Saturday, Sunday afternoons, whatever hours they would give you. A really great job at a medical company where I just scanned documents for a whole month. Ah, you did. You did. That was amazing. And you actually earned all your money and Mm. you went off on your gap year. And you, I hope you were possibly influenced by the fact that when I was having my little rant about what a waste of time gap years are, um, that they're nothing more than glorified holiday camps for people who should know better. Um, You didn't go on any of the pre-organised safe yeah, yeah. Um, just a, sensible yeah, really good about it. gap yeah. year types you actually just freewheeled it you t- mm. you got on a plane and you just went to places and then yeah you you know you you got blagged yourself a job on a boat saying that yeah. you got <laughs> that was nice. saying that you'd got sailing experience when that actually <laughs> meant in truth that you'd sailed in a kayak occasionally no i did <laughs> some dinghy sailing like when i was at Brecken. oh like, a little bit of dinghy yeah. sailing oh gosh you like Try and capsize each other, and it was, it was it was really fun. It's not really sail. Yeah, boat I had no idea. I had to even sail that wind. No, exactly. <laughs> so, so, and you blagged your way through that, and you and you it's earned good. some some money, and you made a few mistakes. Eventually, you got on a decent boat, didn't you? And you had yep. a good time around the Caribbean, and then you mm-hmm. went off and hired your car, and you. I bought my car. But bought oh goodness me, yes, you bought your car, but you see, you didn't come to me for those crazy ideas. You just got on with it by then. But yeah, I do Your car also vividly remember purchase. when I... Oh, oh, yes, when you crashed the car. What? what? When did I crash it? Oh, yeah. That was the other guy. He crashed it. Well, you had an you had an incident in the car, and you rang me, and I was at work. I was actually on yeah, a training day in school. Yeah, I think that's homeless people. They were yes. mental. Yes. Anyway. Yes, it's quite nice um, at the time. So anyway. you did touch base <laughs> with them when you were doing a crazy thing that went slightly um, out of hand. Yeah. 
I do very much remember when I got back from my gap year, the change in tune from you being like, Sam, why are you doing this? This is awful. Yes. We'll never pay for this. This is terrible. Yes. You really shouldn't do this too. Yeah. Sam, I'm so proud of you. This is such a good thing you've done this year. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I got it. I absolutely yeah. got it. And in fact, you know, as soon as you'd gone and, and we were getting reports back and pictures on Facebook and, and all the things that you were doing, I thought, actually, this Sam was made for this. He was absolutely born to do this. And we sort of stopped worrying at that point. And as long as I... I'd got sight of you on Facebook every few days. I didn't need you to talk to me. I just needed to know that you were you were still right. there. And and this was what we're talking nearly ten years ago now. Yes, yeah, so Facebook was still just starting. Um, so for the benefit yeah, of the listeners, my, yeah. I was as his mother on Facebook before Sam because I was before a anybody. very early adopter. Yeah, I've now been, I've been, I was kind of late to Facebook just because you were on Facebook, <laughs> and I was like, "Well, yes. so be and all my friends left. Like, oh crap! <laughs> <laughs> my mum's already there." Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that was good. Facebook was great for me to just know that you were okay, and I didn't fuss or chase you or, or bother or anything. Um, the only time I was slightly worried was when you were actually you got to South America and you went into radio silence for about two weeks, just over two weeks. Yeah, had my. Um, before the iPhone, I had like an Apple, the MP3 mm-hmm. one. It was kind of like the iPhone, just no phone capabilities, and I used that for Wi-Fi. But then I got stolen in mm-hmm. Peru, or Bolivia, I think, and then I got arrested. And, and so I was like, I should probably just not mention anything for a few days until yeah, I'm nice. quite far away from where I was arrested, and then go, oh, so mum, that time I was arrested. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. I'm in a different country now, so we'll move on. Yeah, so that was that was the only time I was a bit sort of, and I wasn't actually greatly worried. I just thought I, I assumed something had happened, like mm. you'd lost your phone or yeah, you'd, something. You know, um, I just do believe that bad news travels fast, and um, yeah, we'd have been yeah. notified by the authorities if something terrible had happened. Um, so I assumed you would just sort of run to ground for whatever reason. Mm. Um, so yeah. But in terms of you coming to us for advice, I have to say it always gives me a nice little glow when you do still come back to us for, for some advice. Uh, and and I think probably we we advise each other now, now that you're sort of, you know, much more mature and, and, mm. and older and experienced and things, uh, on a mutual sort of basis. Yeah, I think, you know, I can ask you about things. It's not a... Changed more yeah, yeah. after my gap year when I started running my business and I was talking to you about mm. those kind of things. But, um, yeah, so when you were at university and you wanted to uh, enter that competition for um, some entrepreneur um, funding, mm-hmm. um, that was great. I was I was really thrilled that you'd come to us to, to ask about, you know, what sort of business should I set up. And you got some great ideas, haven't you, about um, solar panels and things. Yeah. And, uh, Basically, Tesla's business plan back before Tesla well, it was really, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. All the things they are now doing. <laughs> There's remarkable yeah, similarities. But, um, so that was great. And it was, it, it was nice to unpack that with you because you've got some great ideas and you weren't sure whether you needed to put all of your ideas or your biggest and your best ideas out to get the funding. Or, and I think, well, you talked to, to Dad as well, not just me. Um, or, or whether it should be something more realistic, because if you were mm. to win the prize, which obviously you didn't know when you went into it, whether you yeah, were going yeah. to get funding or not, if you were going to win, you'd got to sort of act on it, haven't you? You've got mm. to put this business into action. So I think we we were a bit concerned that you were going to start a solar panel business while you were still only a first year undergraduate. Um, so so we, we we went down the much more... Yeah, studenty I mean, type business yeah, route, which was to think about the the cycle courier business and the, the cycle taxi business, which you set up and actually went on to be very successful um, yeah, in Bristol right. during that time that you were at university. And it meant you didn't have to go work down the supermarket mm. uh, or, you know, get waitress, uh, waitress, sorry, on, like waiter jobs in... Um, in a calf or, or yeah. yeah, you could even give up the lifeguarding. So that that gave you employment. It gave you some revenue. It gave you a, it gave you a way of finding yeah. out about how to um, sort of attract mm. funding, whether it was yeah. for a straightforward business or a social enterprise. We sort of talked about all of those things, yeah, didn't we? Employing people 
born. You, you, yes, exactly. The different ways of employing people, whether it was on a proper employment contract or on a on a sort of freelance or um, you know a sort of paid hours contract. Um, you know, it, we had, it gave us license to talk about all sorts of very grown up things. Mm. Um, actually, yeah, I hadn't really understood what you guys did when I was growing up. When you guys kind of had businesses and things, yeah, yeah, kind of like yeah. it was just like, oh, this is what parents do. Mm. And it wasn't until I started doing it, it was like. Oh, crap, all this stuff. <laughs> like, uh, oh, guys, I totally understand. But also, I don't know what I'm doing. So, you can tell me. And, and uh, it, was, it was nice to show you how to set up a limited company and talk mm. you through. We had all those conversations about the advantages and pros and cons of going as a sole trader or as a limited company. And that was great to be able to talk to an 18-year-old who also happens to be your son. 20 by then. Well, you probably... You, were, you, must, you must have been getting on for 20 by then because you'd had yeah. a gap year and you were... No, hey, not quite, because you were sort of... Yeah, no, I was 20. It was Easter of your first year. No, because I, I remember vividly waking oh. up on my 20th birthday, naked and covered in swastikas in Birmingham, being oh. like, I don't really want to get drunk anymore. <laughs> and then going to my own freshers a week later and being like... Oh, right, okay. Oh, God, I had to do my drinking. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and never really being quite so keen on partying by the time I got to uni. Okay, all right, fair enough. You remember that. So I was I definitely know. 20. No, but anyway. So, yeah, so the business was, that was nice to be able to talk to you about that. Mm. That was, it was good. And it was, it was nice to be able to show you how, actually how easy it is um, to, and, and how inexpensive. You don't have to go down a very expensive, you don't have to pay a solicitor. Um, you know, it's, you just look at Companies House on their website. They give you all the advice that you ever need for setting up a company. And, um you can go off and, and do it relatively, you know, for just a few tens of pounds. Yeah, so, I think in general the whole starting of my first business and running it was quite safe, even though yeah. it seemed pretty impressive I had people employed oh, and was doing stuff. Yeah. I never really took any huge risks. No, so it was low tech, like, low risk. You didn't you carry any stock. Yeah, yeah I nearly fell second year. Yeah, Otherwise, I think you were worried actually once... Once you set it up and you suddenly realise mm. what a massive commitment it was, and you do only do things properly, don't you? you yeah. Once you set it up, you were very committed to it. Uh, and I think there, there was a worry that you were mm. letting it all get on top of you and you were trying to keep your studies going as well and that something had got to give. But I think you sort of you kept your head above water just a bit. Yeah. yeah, I guess you guys really helped me stick to a framework of only promising things I could deliver. Like... Re- well, I did take a few big risks and sometimes I'd be in a meeting and someone would ask for some service that we'd never really thought about doing and I'd just be like, oh yeah, we totally, we're professionals at that, that's that's our thing, we're good at that. And <laughs> I'd scramble madly to like put stuff together and try and sell it to someone else so we had enough to hire like a new rider to do this new service, which was kind of exciting, but we always managed to deliver and which is what's important, even if it did nearly kill me. But you did win. You did win a lot of business. You got yourself a lot of customers and regular customers. Um, you quickly learned that the taxi business was way more difficult to try to run, mm. um, where you're dealing with lots of individual customers on a one-off, yeah. low-value basis. You know, people will only pay you a very small amount to get you from A to B. Um, Whereas your bread shop and your, your news agents and your people that you're delivering magazines for and these sorts of things yeah, so will pay you repeat regularly. business. They want, they need to plan. So it allowed mm. you to, to plan and you could have a rider available yeah, at seven o'clock each morning to pick up the bakery run. You know, you're going to earn this much. Yeah. yeah. That was much more straightforward and a lot less hassle. It was still an amount of hassle when riders didn't turn up. It specification for the app Uber, which obviously now exists. Yes, Back when it didn't, it was like, oh, that's yes. like, all my problems. <laughs> yeah, you did. And no one would build it for me. Wow. Could be a scientist. So, um, so that, that was very interesting, see, seeing all that develop. And to see, you know, the, the unexpected terms, uh, that, that, the, that relationship that you forged with the people at... Um, Basecamp? Yale and Basecamp and the DHL. delivery people. DHL. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I think if you had ended up staying in the courier business, mm. you know, you'd already forged a network of people who would have been able to help Yodel, you, yeah. Yodel, that's it, grow that into a more substantial business rather than a student business, mm. if you know what I mean. And I don't mean that in, in a dismissive way. I think the business you ran was appropriate and right 
for the situation you were yeah, in yeah. at the time. You know, it was a very genuine business. And you did fantastic work um, getting funding, uh, taking the eco-friendly um, message out. You became part of the Green Bristol Project campaign yeah. thing, which was very, very worthwhile. And I think reflected well on you and on them and on all the people that were involved on in, mm. with you on that. So, but, you know, you've learned an awful lot from that, doing presentations and Dragon's Den type things that yeah. you went in for. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I wish you used to be really bad at presenting and talking in general, which I'm still getting better at. But, um, yeah, that helped a lot. That did help a lot. It did, yeah. it really... Do you think you did anything to make me more motivated? So I certainly remember, like, some of the kids at school were given, like, an incentive, like, oh, if you get, like, an A in GCSE, we'll give you 50 quid or something. No. I remember asking you, and being like, no. oh, guys, and you're like, no, Sam. <laughs> like, <Nope. laughs> if you were want to do well in life, you'll try hard. And I'm like, uh, yep. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll try hard. It's my problem, isn't it? That's okay. right. Absolutely right. Um, no, I've never believed that children should ever be paid to go to school. They should never be paid to pass exams. Um, no, no, I would never, ever tie those into financial reward. Um, no, that's just something you have to do. You just have to get on with it and you just have to put the work in um, and you'll get your reward in the rest of your life. I don't think we did shelter you when you were young. I remember no. sending you off to Spain when you were about 15. Yeah, that, that was, was really good for me. Those sorts of things. Yeah, I don't um, remember you kind of always because I didn't like an ice cream and be like, oh, Sam, go and ask the lady for an ice cream. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> you can do it. I can't speak. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. The lady will be nice to you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> don't think so. So, yeah, no, I did used to do all that sort of thing. Mm. But then my mum did with me. She just did. Yeah. She did. In fact, I remember from when we were very young, and, and and she and she told us this. She would send us. We didn't. We only went to next door. I was going to say we went. She sent us miles away. Um, but we'd go and stay the night round at next door. Yeah. Rather than getting babysitters <laughs> in, <laughs> oh, if right. she and my dad went out. Okay. We would go and have a camp bed. Yeah. With the I next door neighbours, like, just on around there, the weekend. No, she said, "No, this will be good for you. No, this will be very good for you because um, if ever I have to go into hospital or something, and you have to go and stay with next door, then um, you'll be used to it." Yeah, and you mm. know what she was like. How she used to talk. Yeah. And so I was what cool. I don't know, three, kind four, like... five, six years old, and that's what we used to do. So yeah. uh, you know, I, I never there was never that sort of. Oh, I want my mummy. All that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, turfed out and always get on with it. Yes. Very, very stoic. Mindset. Yes, she did teach us to be stoic, and I've, I've tried to pass the same on yeah. to you and Kim. Remember that summer where I slept on the floor for a whole summer for yes, no real reason? I do. <laughs> don't really know why I did that. No, I don't know why you did that. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that was just but, some random stoicism coming out of my. I'll let you get on with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember you not being like, like, Sam, you put a bed, like. <laughs> Yeah. Why do we even have this bed for you? <laughs> but we get it camping if I do this. Yeah, that's yeah, that's fun. Yeah. That sort of thing. And now I hate sleeping on floors and camping. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that you can if but you have to. <laughs> what do you wish I would do less of? I don't know. I think maybe l- sli- only slightly less. <laughs> Sli- <laughs> slightly less of the multitasking. Yeah, because I think you're very talented, and I think you don't always give yourself a chance because you're so busy trying to do lots of other things at the same mm. time that I sometimes think, oh gosh, he could really shine at that, but he's so busy. You know, maybe you, um, you IT development stuff that you're doing. Yeah, you know, I think you've got so many other distractions on your time that. You probably are being the best developer. Stop doing you a can podcast, Sam. Um, that's, that's what you're saying. No, that's, um, well, actually, like, well, maybe yes. Not necessarily the podcast, but but just some of the other things that you do. Yeah. To give yourself some space to really focus, and maybe. Um, that's actually a really good point. To be, yeah. allow yourself the time and space to really push to the boundaries of, of expertise mm. on something. Yeah, rather than trying to to do that and be in several different choirs across several different continents at the same time. Two. 
to. That's well, that's, you know, that's well, exactly. Do you see point. what I mean, though? And I'm not trying to, though. Trying to, yeah. you know, put yeah. yourself out and about there as being the person who supports and helps other people to start up businesses, because I know that's another passion of yours. Mm. And try, and then once they start up their businesses, they're constantly calling on you for advice. And so you're trying to get your own, say it's your development expertise, honed, but you're mm. constantly on the phone or text or social media trying to help these other people who are tripping over things that you tripped over six, seven, eight years ago. Mm. Um, so maybe I think just being a bit kinder to yourself in terms of, of your time instead of trying to do everything. But I have to, having said all of that, I stand back and admire how well you do across how many things that you do. Because mm. I don't think I could do that amount of multitasking. And I think I, I do sometimes worry slightly that um, you just need a little bit of stillness time. Yeah. A little bit of just let all of that go. Turn off your phone. Turn off your laptop. Yeah, we must have a bit more like, a, oh, this weekend where I don't do anything. Mm, don't know why I haven't asked you that before. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, cool. Um, That's all. Then what do you wish I would do more of? Oh. Well, maybe I know you like meditating and yoga, don't you? Okay. Both of yeah. those things. You can meditate while you do yoga. It's, mm. I think it's better to do that rather than... I know it's possible to do yoga while you're watching the TV because I do it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it is different if you film. do it like, properly. But actually, if you let yourself get into it and get into the moment mm. of it, it becomes a meditation exercise in itself. And I yeah, think that nice. would give you, again, I might have been saying just a few minutes ago, just that little bit of still space where your mind can just switch off from the busyness of of all of the things that you get into. And I think probably then you'd go back to it really refreshed and imaginative mm. again and, and those little creative sparks can sort of get flying again because you've given yourself a bit of space. That's, um, so maybe you could do a bit more yoga and meditation. But that doesn't mean get up earlier to do it or go to bed later to do it. It yeah. means organising your time better in the day mm. to allow a bit of space. Yeah, when I'm in somewhere... But like we'll be in the same schedule. I generally do sort mm. that out. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think I'm not yeah. as yeah. good at meditating as I'd like to be. That's all I can say. That's I want to do like a proper retreat for like a two weeks where you kind of get forced to so like take your phone and laptop off you at the door and like yeah, you get might crazy actually, and then I would build, yeah, maybe build it up. <laughs> yeah, build yeah. it up, Sam. I think maybe it's five or ten minutes first, yeah. not a fortnight. No, that's kind of what I like. To, Going climbing is like you just ignore everything or well, you go exactly. biking and stuff for a day. In but... fact, that was interesting. When you sent me the photographs of you climbing, my first thought was, I hope he's concentrating on that. Because I, I know what you like. <laughs> you I can can't imagine... be taking your phone yeah. off the climbing wall. Oh, not your phone, but just, I could just imagine you running ideas all through your head the whole time. And, uh, so... Oh, yeah, I definitely had a few ideas going on sometimes. <laughs> You know, and, and I'm thinking, you, know, you should be, brain. you should really be utterly focused on yeah, where's the next handhold, where's my when next handhold. When we had your it was generally like, oh god, <laughs> <laughs> everything hurts. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Help. That should focus you, mind. Yeah, really. no, it was. It was so that really would be good. Point. That would be good for you. Yes, I'm yes. sure. If you like, you're three weeks climbing, that that is almost Oops. like a retreat. Mm. Yeah. yeah, same way. I want to do more like kite surfing and all these things. Yes, kind of yeah. slow. Yeah, that's good. Okay. I went on to talk about my challenges with dyslexia, which took rather a while and wasn't all that useful. And then on to things that should be on the school curriculum, which again took rather a while and wasn't that useful. We then moved on to books, where my mum recommends one of the best books of all time. I do remember when I was a young English teacher, um, The Secret Diary of Adrian Mole had just come out. And I remember you gave me that book. And I yeah, I, like, I gave oh, wow. <laughs> and I, well, I spoke to my then head of department and said, I've heard this fantastic story serialised on the radio, because it was written as a radio play to start with. Yeah. So I hear this fantastic story on the radio, and um, it's coming out as a book, and I think we should get it for the English department. And so the head of department went away and ordered a copy and read it and then and came back and said, are you mad? We can't read this to the children. Yeah. Well, the bit where he's measuring <laughs> his penis and stuff, maybe. <laughs> so, but, so then, so, so that was good. early 1980s, and I was told we couldn't read Adrian Mole in school, whereas now it's, you know, it's old-fashioned. 
Can you explain why you think I would be a good podcast host? Um, because uh, you have a lovely smile. People can't see that, Mum. No, but but the host, if they're in the room with you or on a Skype with you... That's a very good point. While you're doing the <laughs> podcast, they can. And you always come across, I think, because you are, it's not a, a front. You're a very genuine person. You've never needed to put a front on for people. You just are what you are. And mm. so if you're in a shy mood, you come across as shy. If you're in a curious mood, you come across as curious. Um, if you're in a busy mood you just come across as busy um you just yeah. are what you are and, and people know where they are with you at any point in time so i think people will talk to you and they'll open up to you and that's what your listeners want to hear is you engaging with your guest but mm. you're a good listener you give people room to cool i feel like i'm going to be a good host now <laughs> so i think you will be of Thanks. course you will be that's really nice. That's all right, sweetheart. I feel warm inside. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Nice. <laughs> a little glow. <glare. laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh. Okay, cool. cool. Excellent. Um, oh, well, thanks, thanks a lot, Sam. So. And we'll chat again soon. <laughs> yeah, get back to the ironing or something. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for delaying the ironing. <laughs> no, that's all right. That's, <laughs> it's not a problem. <laughs> Any excuse. Any Besides, use. I finished my tea now, so it's time to stop. Okay. It's a wrap. So, that was my mum. I did forget to ask her how you might get in touch. And you can find her on Twitter at Virtual Jane. Uh, She did mention the fact she is on Facebook before me, which she loves telling everybody. But don't try and find her there because, I don't know, it's a bit weird. She also runs a YouTube channel with my father and various other band members who I grew up calling uncle and things like that. And only found out much later I'm not related to them. Um, and they play nice music from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So if you want to find that channel, it's Nick and Jane. I'll uh, put a link in the notes. We do allude to some topics that sound like they need a bit more backstory covering of them, like why was I in prison? Why was I driving with a bunch of homeless people in my car when I had a car crash? And that can be covered another time because the podcast is now long enough. But there is one subject that we uh, briefly mentioned that I felt I should probably address now because the uh, time when I woke up covered in swastikas, uh, I would just like to mention I am not a supporter of the Nazi party and I was not very happy that I was covered in swastikas and by covered in swastikas I meant that people had used a uh, permanent marker and drew them all over me though to be fair it was more penises than swastikas as a ratio but it was very frustrating and they were even in my eyelids and uh, it was it was a terrible time and um, yeah I would just like to clear that up <laughs> I had no intention of that happening and uh, would definitely not recommend getting your friends to mix your drinks when it's your 20th birthday and even if you are good at drinking games like me you should remember when you're a lightweight and stop drinking even if you are able to down things, because bad things happen like that. And now to move on to some top tips from the episode. I'm still surprised by some of the great things I discovered during this conversation. The format of an open podcast where I can ask my mother personal things about me, like what I should do with my life, was really insightful. I really recommend asking your own family questions like, what do you wish I did more, or what do you wish I did less? And just see what you learn about yourself, like what have you got to lose? Instead of advertisers this episode, I have some recommendations. I read a recent blog about spending time with family. By the time you turn 18, you've already spent 95% of the time you will ever spend with your parents. I also found a website that I'll link in the show notes that you can put your parents' age into and then the regularity that you go to see them. It will then tell you how many times you will see each other again before your parents die. It's a pretty shocking reminder to bother to go and see them when it might be a bit inconvenient to to go do it. So from those things, it definitely inspires you to spend more time with family. And as that's how I started this podcast, I thought that was a useful recommendation and it made me feel a bit sad at the time. As this is a self-improvement podcast, I'm going to break down the three best tips from each of my guests. And in this case, my mum actually gives some great ones. Instead of listening to Tim Ferriss or Silicon Valley people, you can just go talk to my mum and she'll come out with, like, top business advice. So, onto that. So to start with, number one, stoicism. 
The practice of resilience and stepping outside of your comfort zone to reduce your fear of losing everything and appreciating what you do have. She actually got this from my nan, who was a crazy awesome lady. She used to send her kids to the neighbours randomly just so they'd be okay if for some reason the parents died, which I guess is the ultimate resilience for any child and is a practice I haven't really heard of these days. Uh, Number two, meditation and focus. This was a really big one from her. The practice of calming your mind and helping to find focus and peace. And from that, try to not do so many things at once so you can apply more focus on the things that are your priorities and ultimately be more successful as a whole. Remember that often, less is more. 3. Test your ideas. The earlier, the better. So don't be afraid to start a business at uni. If things go tits up, then you're just back at your home with your parents anyway. It's okay to play it safe and try less risky business models that aren't going to change the world straight away, but will help teach you the essentials of launching a business, which you can then scale up. It also makes it easier to pivot your business into serving a product that is more popular than what your initial idea is. So basically, think sensibly about what fits your situation the best and try things that fit the potential market. In general, if you've dreamed of running a business, but it seems like such a big thing, It's actually not that hard to try and something just on a small scale as a side project without sacrificing everything. And literally anyone can start a business that way. Books. Oh my god. If you haven't read Adrian Mole, you have to go and read it. It is the most hilarious book I've ever read, I think. I've found myself laughing out loud in public so many occasions. And it was just awesome. You should totally read it. I don't want to give anything away. Uh... And then in terms of advice, I also have an anti-advert from my time at home. I recently bought my dad the famous mushroom coffee from Four Sigmatic after I heard so much about it on various other podcasts and the hub about it in Silicon Valley. Its supposed huge mental benefits and great taste were completely lost on my dad. His main feedback was, why on earth have you bought me instant coffee that tastes like mushrooms? So I belatedly took my present back and bought him a case of BrewDog. I then tried to give this coffee to some of my caffeine-addicted friends, none of whom jumped at the chance, and I got the feeling they were just taking it off my hands to just go and throw it away. Personally, I don't drink caffeine, so it's not very useful for me. So I have three packs of uh, ten sachets of different types of mushroom coffee that I'm willing to give away to the first listeners to send me their details. Basically, I'll send you one sachet that you can try for free, and that way you won't waste your money on mushroom coffee if you don't like it. So yeah, hit me up on Twitter, at Sam Harris Tweets, and um, yeah, I'll send you some coffee, because why not waste not want not, hey? As always, thanks a lot for listening. If you found the podcast useful, please support me by rating the podcast on iTunes or your preferred app. Please become a subscriber and share your favourite podcast with others as it really helps me grow the podcast. Uh, you can follow me at Sam Harris Tweets and give me any feedback you have. And I hope that gives you something useful to think about until next time where I'll be interviewing my friend and serial entrepreneur, Tomiwa Ade, about his uh, project to launch 24 startups in 24 months and generally be a nomad around the world. It's going to be a great episode and I hope to see you there. I'm Sam, and this has been another episode of the Growth Mindset Podcast. I hope you enjoy your day.